Humans are complex creatures. We are naturally suspicious, and it's not easy to manipulate us into thinking that one of us is someone else. Sure, my husband, that guy right there, can call his mom, pretending to be his brother, and she will totally buy it for a minute because they kind of sound alike, but the deception actually falls apart as soon as she can see him because they don't actually look that much alike and humans use multiple senses. Which isn't to say that our senses don't have power and authority over us. <laughs> All right, has anyone here ever been through a particularly emotional breakup? Never. Yeah, okay, so you know the drill. You go into a shop or a restaurant, you think you see your recent ex in the back, or maybe you hear their voice, and even if it's not them, your heart seizes up. Your hands go clammy. Maybe you have a little trouble breathing for a minute. None of this is in your control. You've been fooled, if only for a moment, and your mind and body reacted. You can thank your amygdala for that. That's a very teeny tiny orange dot that's kind of hidden underneath the bigger orange dot and it's an asshole. <laughs> On a more personal note, this is my grandmother, was my grandmother. One of my grandmother's favorite perfumes was Giorgio Beverly Hills. It's a very distinctive and somewhat fruity scent and I've never met anyone else ever who has ever worn it around me. So I came to associate the aroma very specifically with her a larger-than-life woman who knew exactly what she wanted in her life and generally got it through a lot of hard work, perseverance, and, frankly, a somewhat domineering and overbearing personality. <laughs> Sorry, Grandma. Um, contrast this with me at seven years old. Small, slight, I barely knew what I wanted in any given minute, yet willfully and stubbornly objected to anyone else telling me what to do or how to do it. Thank you, Kurt. I'm sure everybody outside of Kurt, this is news for them, but I, I, it is actually kind of how I used to be. Used to. Um, now, I adored my grandmother. We did have a lot of good times, but there were also plenty of times that were pretty tense and combative. And the Giorgio, the perfume, became a trigger for me, setting my hair on end, putting me in a defensive posture. All of this was automatic and definitely not something I thought about at age seven. Now, if this is the kind of power a little aromatic concoction of chemicals can have over a creature as complicated as a human being, imagine the impact that a scent can have over a much simpler species, say an ant with a brain the size of a small grain of sand, a creature that largely operates on base instinct and evolution. There are, in fact, several species that have found an evolutionary advantage in manipulating insects through scent. It's a mechanism called chemical mimicry, and it's actually pretty fascinating how effective it can be in nature. Broadly speaking, there are three types of chemical mimicry. In one, the purpose is to disguise oneself as another species, to blend in, infiltrate, and take advantage of the other species over a long term. In another, the goal is to smell like your prey in order to lure it in and capture it. And finally, there are some species that need to entice another species through scent in order to reproduce in the first place. While the deceptions manifest in distinctly different ways, the goal of chemical mimicry is always the same to let another species know, hey, I'm one of you. Thank you, yes. Anybody wanna hear about some bugs? Yeah. Woo! All right, meet the posid beetle, or possines, also known as the ant nest beetle. I'll give you one guess what it likes to eat. So this handsome fellow's relationship with its prey, it's ants often leads to a comparison of the beetle to the famous Trojan horse we mentioned in another talk earlier this evening. But in truth, they're actually a little bit more like insect vampires. These vampires, excuse me, beetles, rely on chemical messaging to charm their favorite food, the ants, 
um, into thinking that they're actually talking to the queen of the ant colony. The scents so effectively interfere with ant communication that despite the size, color, and shape differences between the species, the ants completely buy into the con and are at the mercy of their imposter queen. Secondarily, the beetles also employ stridulation to mimic the sounds of queen ants. In case it's not clear from this slide, stridulation is how crickets and grasshoppers make their very signature sounds. Once embedded within an ant colony, the beetles live among them and they feast. The possines even trick the ants into raising the young beetles who continue to live out their lives among them freely and unimpeded as parasitic members of the colony. Much is still unknown about the relationship between the beetles and the, and the ants that they menace. Frankly, most of the research I found about the beetles is currently focused on a really cool evolutionary theory called adaptive radiation, which is actually a very interesting topic that you should look into, but it's one for another talk. And before leaving the posse beetles for the night, I would like to address this chosen horse analogy because it keeps showing up over and over and over and over in my research, and it's kind of annoying. I get it. The beetles are invited into a defended space and then attack it from within, and it's kind of like the Trojan horse story. But there are two major flaws with that. For one, no one thought the giant wooden horse was actually a citizen of Troy. <laughs> Whereas the ant beetles, despite looking nothing like the ants, effectively convinced the ants that actually they're, they're ants. Honest. And secondly, when the Greek warriors popped out of the horse and started slaughtering the Trojans, the Trojans, however, ineffectively did try to fight back, whereas the beetles kill the ants all the time and then keep living among them while being treated like ant royalty. So hear me out. Dracula didn't look like your typical human, and yet he charmed and hypnotized humans into buying into his schemes and working for him even as he preyed on the very humans who served him. In conclusion, posset beetles are vampire bugs and should no longer be associated with the Trojan horse story. The end of the <laughs> posset beetle section of the talk. Anyway, um, <clears throat> this is a bolus spider. Okay, technically it's a picture of a bolus spider with an image of Applejack badly photoshopped onto it because many people get freaked out by images of spiders, which I didn't want for this talk. So. <laughs> While I acknowledge that this is now a very confusing image, <laughs> hopefully it is at least slightly less scary, at least not in the same way. And honestly, the bolus spider is a little bit confusing as a creature to begin with. Uh, it's a type of orb weaver spider. Everybody knows orb weavers. They make these magnificent webs that hopefully you don't run into face first all over the, the place in the fall. Uh, so, right, orb weaver spider, but... This spider doesn't spin an impressive web to catch prey. It doesn't spin a web at all. There's a reason for that. So its favorite food is the noctuid moth. Noctuids have a sort of powdery fluff between the scales on their wings. And if they come into contact with a web, those scales detach. And the fluffy powder helps the moths slip right through the silk. In short, the webs don't really work on the moth, but the spider still needs to eat. So how does it do it? All right, you see that dangling little line of silk with a blob on the end of it at the bottom of the image? So that's where the bola spider gets its name and how it gets its favorite food. All right, quick history lesson. A traditional bolus weapon, bolus meaning balls, uh, consists of weighted balls on the ends of connected cords that are whipped around and thrown at an enemy, entangling their legs and preventing the enemy's escape. Bolus weapons are mostly associated with gauchos from the 18th and 19th centuries, but were actually utilized all over South America for hundreds of years, mostly for hunting cattle and larger game, but also against enemy humans in wartime. The spider version's a little different. They only employ one silk cord, and the weighted ball is a sticky silk blob, but the principle is actually similar. Depending on the species, the spider will either dangle or swing around the bolus, and that sticky blob will gum up the wings of its favorite moth, preventing escape long enough for the spider to swoop in, inject the moth with paralyzing venom, and then wrap it up like an egg roll to be eaten later. 
Apologies for anybody who's planning to get Chinese food after this talk. Um, so how do you lure moths to the sticky bolus trap in the first place? Through, through the science of scent. So the female bolus spiders produce a scent that mimics the sex pheromones of female noctuid moths. Male moths who smell this come looking for a good time. The spider feels the vibrations in the air from the moth's approach, and that moth ends up being a spider dinner, which is probably not the kink that moth had in mind. That's not even the interesting part. The really, okay, the really interesting part. The spiders have adapted their scent that, pr that they produce based on prey availability. So let's take, let's say there are two different kinds of noctuid moths with two different chemical signatures at different, and different times of activity. We'll call them moth A and moth B because I am not terribly creative. Moth A is active in the early evening and is drawn to pheromone A. Moth B is active late at night and is drawn to pheromone B. The spiders give off different chemical signatures during the two different periods of the evening. Early evening, pheromone A. Late evening, pheromone B. And where the, there is an overlap between the two moth uh, timelines, the, the spiders produce both scents, combining the two compounds and adjusting the ratio to mimic specific species, which is pretty damn awesome. A final note on bolus spiders. Given their noctur nocturnal prey, these spiders are active at night. In order to avoid being menaced during the day when they're trying to rest, they employ a different kind of mimicry, masquerading as bird poop. The image on the left is bird poop. The image on the right is the spider. Anybody looking for a picture of bird poop on the internet um, is gonna turn up a surprising number of images of various bugs that employ this same life hack and almost no pictures of singular bird poop. <laughs> Ask me how I know. <laughs> on that note, let's move on to the birds and the bees, or more accurately, the flowers and the bees. The spider orchid is a very rare flower. The habitat is being destroyed by human encroachment, Boo, hiss, yes. Climate change is impacting the timing of the growing season, and in the case of Ophrys sphegides, the early spider orchid, among the most endangered of the family, self-pollination simply isn't possible. Enter the buffish mining bee. He's so cute. In the spring, the male mining bees emerge from their winter hibernation and buzz about looking for will say action. Because reasons, the males awaken about a week before their female counterparts. Coincidentally, this is the exact same week the orchids are in full bloom and loaded with pollen to share. These unpollinated orchids then emit odors made of hydrocarbons that perfectly match the odors released by virgin queen bees looking for mates. Weird ass research right there. Anyway, the result, hot bee on flower action. The male bees get so riled up by the scent that they engage in pseudo copulation, which is exactly what you think it is. It's also why I had to censor this slide to protect your delicate sensibilities. <laughs> anyway, those randy bees get all up in those fuzzy flowers, coating themselves with pollen, just rolling around in it, and then they take it to other orchids, thus pollinating those orchids, and they do it again and again. Now, I'm not one to judge, but those bees, they have to really get around, which is honestly probably a good thing for the orchids. It's worth mentioning that while chemistry is king here, there is some secondary mimicry on display with the spider orchid. It's evolved over the millennia to best position itself through size, shape, texture, and to a lesser extent, color, to be an even better mimic of a female bee. 
that's the bottom picture. Or as my very meme-savvy 11-year-old liked to put it, thank you, Halvard, for designing this slide. <laughs> this trumped-up tart of a flower is certainly not going to hoodwink any humans into thinking it's a minor bee. But then our brains are just a wee bit harder to deceive in that way, being slightly larger than bee brains. In closing, brains are set up to react to stimuli, triggers, whether visual, auditory, tactile, or chemical. Smaller brains, like insect brains, can be grossly, even mortally misled by the right triggers. Thankfully, our brains, while still susceptible to some activations, are a little bit more malleable. For my part, I've made my peace with Giorgio Beverly Hills. The scent no longer triggers me into combat mode, but instead it reminds me of my grandmother's strength and her goofy laugh and the time that something I said reminded her not of a funny story, but of two funny stories that she then had to tell me about. Neither was very funny. <laughs> Human brains are complex and we can work to rewire how we think and approach even some of our automatic responses and most of our behaviors. To that, and to my grandmother, I give this toast. <laughs>